This morning we're going to be in three different passages in the Bible. One is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The other is Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. And then we'll be in the book of John, John chapter 19, verses 41 through 42. And we're going to be looking at the subject this morning, the gospel gardens. Now the word gospel means good news. So when we think about each one of these gardens, and there are going to be three of them we're going to look at this morning, I want you to think about the words good and then the word news. Good news. So each garden offered good news. The Garden of Eden offered good news. The Garden of Gethsemane offered good news. And the garden where they laid Jesus in the tomb offered good news. Look at Genesis chapter 3, if you would, please. Verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, if you would please, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now, if you would please, in the book of John. John chapter number 19, verses 41 and 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a sepulcher. Excuse me, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. I know we've prayed, but let's pray again. Father, I am coming to you now for strength. I'm coming to you now for guidance. I'm coming to you now, Father, to lead in every way, Father, when it comes to this message. Father, my heart's heavy this morning, not only because the message is heavy upon my heart, but Father, my heart's heavy for other reasons as well. My heart's heavy for our country. And Father, we ask that you, Father, if it be thy will to truly direct our political leaders that are in office and especially our spiritual leaders this morning, Father, to bring a climate into this country that would be pleasing to you. Father, I pray you be with our church this morning. Father, there are those here this morning that are carrying burdens so great that I can't even imagine, Father, what they must be carrying in their heart and in their life. Father, I can't even imagine what people are going through this morning outside the walls of this church with sickness and illness and death, the pressures of life that, Father, are so many and they're so great. We should be such a thankful people because we are here and we are in this building and we have so much to be thankful for. Father, it's my prayer this morning that as we dig a little deeper into this message, that, Father, you would bring out the truths there that you would want us to know. You would re reveal to us, Father, the information that you would want us to place into our lives so that we can have the transformation that all of us so desperately need. We ask this now in your Son's name. Amen. Three thoughts to the message this morning, and notice here the first one, if you would, please. The first thought to the message is the Savior was promised in the garden. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, And God said, Let us, God the Father, God the Son, the Savior, the Holy Spirit, make man in our image. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it shall bruise, injure thy head, and thou shalt bruise, injure thy heel, which simply means Christ the promised one 
would injure, would bruise, would apply the deadly blow, the fatal blow to the head of the serpent. Now, I don't know what you're going through this morning. As I said earlier, I don't know what your life has been like this week. I've not walked in your shoes. I've not lived in your home. I've not gone to work with you. I've not experienced the week that some of you have had. But I do know this, that there is nothing that has come into your life that God can't help you with. The enemy is out to devour us. The enemy is out to destroy us. The Bible is clear that he's our adversary, that he's our enemy, that he's a roaring lion, and that he's seeking every Christian to not have a relationship with them, but to destroy them. And if we allow him the opportunity to come into our lives, into our families, into marriages, into our workplace, into our church, I promise you this, that his goal will be to divide and conquer. When he got into the garden, and he slithered his way in as that serpent. His goal was to divide Adam and Eve. His goal was to get them to question God. How many times have you said this when you've gone through a trying time in your life? God, I'm looking for an answer. God, why aren't you answering me? God, I need some help here in this situation. And God, where are you? I need you in my life. And God, I cannot find you. Well, that's strange because God said he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And he's standing right beside you all alone. All we have to do is call out to him for help. Did God not come and walk with Adam in the cool of the day? Did God and Adam not have a designated time and a designated place to meet and to fellowship? Of course, they did. We know that because the Bible is clear on that. That at the cool of the day, God walked in the garden with Adam, and there they fellowshiped. And God gave Adam basic instructions on how to take care of the garden, how to keep the garden, the fruit to eat, the forbidden fruit to leave alone. Here's what I've learned about many Christians. And I throw myself into that category because it's easy for me when I'm going through a rough time in my life to say, okay, God, what's the answer to this question? And I'm waiting for God to answer me. And sometimes, as you've heard it before, he will answer with a yes, or a no, or not right now. But here's the deeper lesson for us to learn. Would Adam have fallen, and would Eve had fallen, if they had kept up that daily fellowship at that designated time, at that designated place with God? Do you suppose they slipped just a little in the Garden of Eden? with their fellowship with God? Do you think maybe it got old a little bit for Adam and Eve? Do you suppose they thought at one point as they were living there in the garden, as the sun began to set, oh, we got to meet with God. You know, God's going to be calling out for us and we've got to go do it. Do you think that what was once joyful, what was once exciting, what was once enthusiastic, now kind of faded off into the distance some, and it wasn't as fun, it wasn't as exciting, it wasn't as great as it once was. And then as their eyes drifted from God, their eyes drifted over to the enemy. What about us? You know, there was a time in our lives as Christians when we were vibrant for the Lord. We couldn't wait to get back to church on Sunday morning. We couldn't wait for the clock to tick by for Sunday night. We couldn't wait 
for Wednesday midweek Bible study. As a matter of fact, we couldn't wait until the pastor got up and said, want to remind everybody, and they didn't have to do it on PowerPoint, and they didn't have to do it with a lot of energy. They simply announced there's going to be a series of messages during such and such a week, and so and so is going to be preaching those messages, and perhaps the pastor said, it's a friend of mine that pastors another church, or this is an evangelist from some other place, and we're going to have a week-long meeting called Revival, and people couldn't wait to get there. As a matter of fact, as the days slipped by, there were those who said, do we have to close the meeting? Can't we go a little longer? Can't we stay just a little longer? I'm just getting into this thing, and, and now we're about to close it. And the evangelist would say, it sounds like a great idea. Let's go another week. Then the church would go another week, and the attendance grew every night because people wanted to hear God's man deliver God's message because it touched their heart, and they couldn't wait to get there. And they didn't come. If it was at 7 o'clock, at 7.15 or 7.30, many of them were there early because they wanted to get a seat. And they didn't sit in nice cushion seats like we sit in. Sit on those old hard wooden chairs. Those chairs that were not good for the physical body to, to sit on because they were uncomfortable and we'd squirm and turn some. But we never thought about that. Because when the evangelist took the pulpit and took the stage and took the platform, we were so ready spiritually what he had to say, we were willing to endure the hardness of the chair to hear the messenger of God. Jesus endured the cross, didn't he? For the joy that was set before him. There's joy in pain if we're going through it for the right reason. As Reba sang, through the fire. God wants to purify us, and he will test us, he will take us through the fire, and when we get to the other side, we're to be purified as gold and silver. But as we go through the fire, it's going to reveal our true character. It's going to reveal who we really are. It's going to reveal what we're all about. My point is this. Have you slipped from that time and place every day where you're supposed to meet with God? Do you have a designated time that you meet with God with your Bible open and your hands folded and you say, God, this is my time with you. This is my quiet time and no one is going to interfere with it. If you do not have that time in your life, I can promise you this. It will not be long because we have the nature of Adam and Eve in all of us. It won't be long until you slip from that walk with God and your eyes will be focused on the enemy. And then it's going to be, I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to turn. I don't know which way to go. I don't know which path to take in life. Oh God, where are you? God's been there all the time. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a painful pill to swallow, but where have you been? God never left. God's sitting there waiting on you every day to show up so that you can fellowship together. He's not been absent. You've been absent. And when that happens in my life, I can't blame God. I have to blame myself. It's not, God, where have you been? It's, Ron, where have you been? Tuesday of this past week, I had to get on my hands and knees and apologize to God. For not being faithful in my commitment to him. Meeting with him. I'd let that slip a little bit. I was doing fine. I was doing great. Every day I was meeting with God. And every day I was opening my Bible and finding out what God had for me. But I had slipped from that. And then things started happening in my life where I'm thinking, I'm not thinking so clearly anymore. I'm not as focused as I used to be. God, what's going on? God didn't have to answer that question. I knew what was going on. Adam and Eve slipped. But you know what? They didn't have to slip, did they? Because they had God ready to meet them at a designated time in a designated place. The enemy, the enemy in the form of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, eventually would be crushed by Jesus Christ with his death on the cross.
of Calvary. Look at the second point this morning. The Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane sheltered the praying Savior. When you're in prayer, and often prayer can become deep travail, because usually when people pray the hardest is when they're going through a really rough time in their life. There was a time when I was younger as a pastor, and I was somewhat disconnected from the feelings of the older generation because I had not lived through the Depression. I had not really gone through the hard times that they went through because my parents were able to pave the path a lot better for me. And so I didn't understand what they were going through. But as I began to get around more people of that generation, my heart became more tender and more compassionate for what they had done for me in my generation. And I remember being at the hospital as a young pastor, visiting people that were sick, some ready to die. And I would make my way to the chapel to not only pray for them, but also to read the prayer requests that were found written in the prayer journal. And there were times when I would walk in there and kneel down and pray. I heard some of the most powerful prayers anyone could ever hear. I heard some of the most disturbing prayers anyone can ever hear. One prayer in particular was this. A mother was in the chapel, down on her hands and knees, and she was praying this prayer. Her son, 26 years old, was on life support. When I heard this woman crying out in prayer, because her head was buried deep in her hands and I couldn't see her face, my head leaned more towards that direction because I recognized this mother's voice. Her son, at one point, was in my youth group. And her prayer was this. She said, Dear God, let my son live and let me die. Let me take his place. I've lived a good life. I've lived a productive life. I've done my best to serve you, but my son is young. And I looked over at her. And she looked up at me, and she embraced me, and I embraced her. And there we prayed. And I walked up to the room where this young man now was laying in a hospital bed, clinging to life. What had happened was this. He went into a jealous rage with his wife because she, he thought she was having an affair. And some type of fight broke out in their mobile home. And whoever was there in that mobile home, I do not know all the details, but they tried to restrain him, and when they did, they grabbed him with their forearm like this, put it underneath his neck, and tilted his neck back until it locked and cracked and literally put a hairline fracture down his back into a spine called a hangman's lock. In other words, it's the same thing that would happen to someone when they were hung on the gallows and their head would tilt or jerk back. It would snap their neck. Except all it did was snap his neck, but he was still alive. He was not yet dead. The doctor comes in, talks to the mom, talks to the dad, and said, he's only alive on life support. What do you want us to do? Here I am, young myself, maybe 30. The mom looks at me and says, we're not going to make any decisions until we find out what Ron has to say on the subject. I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to respond to this. They didn't teach me this in the school of hard knocks or in the school of theology. 
And she said, Ron, you make the decision if our son should remain on life support or not. I said, I can't do that. But I will support you in your decision because the machine was the only thing keeping him alive. They chose to remove him from life support the next morning. And I was there. I saw people gather around his bed holding hands and praying that I'd never seen pray before, nor had I ever seen them in church or opened their Bible. I didn't know anything about these people except they were praying that God would perform a miracle. And they felt as though by holding on to each other's hands they could have the strength that came from a unified group, a unified body. And they were clinging on to hope. They were clinging on to anything that could offer them help. When I think about our Savior being in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I think about Him crying out and saying, Father, if this cup could pass from me, let it pass. But not my will, Father, but yours be done. And we're told that as he was praying, there was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. I've had some pretty agonizing days, and I've had some pretty agonizing weeks, and I've had some months and even some years that I thought, I'm sure glad are over because I don't want to live through that again. Thank God it's not Groundhog Day with Bill Murray all over again. Couldn't go through that. Reliving the same day over and over that was hurtful, that was painful, that brought pain to my life, pain to my heart. Can you imagine living the same day over and over that brought so much pain and hurt and heartache that when you went to bed at night, you actually said to God, I'm glad this day's over? What about reliving it over and over again? Jesus, in travail, was sweating as it were great drops of blood. And when we're in deep prayer and we're pouring out our heart to God and the Bible calls that kind of prayer travail, it's so painful, it hurts so much that the parallel is to that of a mother having a baby. And moms, you know what I'm talking about. That pain is unbearable. But once that little one is born and you hold that little one in your arms, you say it was worth it all. You see, sometimes we have to go through pain in our life in order for us to be able to say, it's been worth it all. Sometimes we pray and do not get the answer we want. Sometimes we pray and we do get the answer we want and we're still not happy. We're the most miserable people on planet Earth as Christians, but yet we ought to be the most happy. You pray, you don't get it, you're unhappy. You pray and you do get it and you're unhappy. You see, happiness is not dependent upon those things which we get and don't get. Happiness is dependent upon the kind of person that we are in Christ and in Him alone. And we've lost sight of that. We've lost sight of coming to church for the reason that we're supposed to be here. It's all about Him and not about us. It's all about learning about Jesus and being filled with the Spirit of God in our life so that we can have a transforming experience while being in the house of God. No other place on planet Earth will transform you into the person that you're supposed to be and you ought to be and what I can be outside of the local church. It's right here where we meet God. Sure, you can pray to God elsewhere. You can read your Bible elsewhere. But you know what? God has set this place apart for worship. Right here, where we join together. You know, I talked to a gal a few years ago who was going through just a real, real rough time in her life personally. Rough time with her kids. They were older kids, adult kids at this time. And she began to share with me all those things that was heavy upon her heart. And her answer was, she was going to move to California. I said, okay. What do you think about that? And as she began to talk, I said, I'm not here to tell you to go, and I'm not here to tell you to stay. But here is what I am going to tell you.
Problems are not geographic. Problems are in our heart. We cannot run from problems because we pack them up in the suitcase of life, place them deep within our heart, and we carry that baggage with us wherever we go. What we have to do is take a good look at that baggage, identify that baggage for what it is, deal with that baggage, give it to God, and let God take care of it for us. The problem is transferring that baggage over into the hands of God because we like to hold on to it. The old ball and chain. Not me. I don't want any baggage. I don't want any ball and chain. I want to give it to God and let Him take care of it. Because you know what? When I think about what my Savior did in the Garden of Gethsemane and how He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, that is beyond me to know the agony and the travail that my Savior was experiencing that day. But more importantly, when I read again in Matthew chapter 26, about where he said to his father, if this cup can pass, let it. I said, God, I'm going to need something a little more with this passage. Can I have something a little more with this? I've not read this in any book of theology. I've not read this in any pastoral study guide. But as I read that, this is what spoke to me. Ron, can you drink the cup? Can you drink whatever it is I give you to do with your life? Can you truly take it all? And I thought to myself, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. And then I began to think about Jesus sitting with the disciples in the upper room. And they were partaking in the Last Supper. Jesus passes out the bread, passes out the meal. And you know how it all went down. Eat the bread. Symbolic of my body. What I'm going to do on the cross. What I'm going to do in the grave. And I'm going to rise again. Then he raised the, the chalice up, or the cup. And Jesus said to his disciples... This is the blood of the New Testament. Drink ye how much of it? All of it. So how much am I supposed to drink? All of it. The pain, the hurt, the agony, the travail, the good things, the bad things life brings. I'm to drink all of it. Because that's what I signed up for. To pick up his cross and follow him. So I thought to myself, this is interesting. Simon Peter has the chalice in his hand. It's filled to the brim. And I'm sure Simon Peter's not even listening to the words echoing out of our Savior's lips. And Simon Peter is over there guzzling it all down. And he's not really listening to what Jesus had just said. I'm not talking about drinking what's inside the cup that's there in the form of some type of juice, I'm talking about can you drink what's about to happen in your life? Can you go the distance? So when Jesus was in the garden and his father and he are communing in prayer, God was saying to him, Son, I need you to go the distance. Can you go the distance? And Jesus said, I can't do it on my own. I'm going to need you. It's not my will, but yours be done. I cannot go the distance, ladies and gentlemen, without Jesus Christ leading the way. I cannot drink of the cup. I'm not strong enough. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not good enough to drink of that cup. I need Jesus to guide me along. Because you see, it's not my will, but his be done. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and his will being done, I wouldn't be here this morning. I'd be doing something else. And if it wasn't for God's will being done in your life, most likely you'd be somewhere else this morning and you wouldn't be here. So the next time you're involved in the Lord's Supper and it comes time for you to drink from the cup, 
When you place that cup to your lips and you begin to fill the juice, press against your tongue and make its way down inside your throat, what I want you to ask yourself is this. Am I going to go the distance? That's the key right there. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. You see, the time now to bruise the serpent's head had drew near. Look at this, third thought. The third and final thought is this. The garden of the tomb was the burial place of our Savior. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. John 19, 41 through 42. When I think about having to say goodbye to anyone that I love with all my heart, it's painful for me. When I think about going to any cemetery and having to speak to those that are living and say goodbye to those who are now dead, that is often more painful than people realize. Because I cannot get through that, nor can I do it without God's strength. But what is on every tombstone that I want us to think about this morning that too often is overlooked and we don't really give that much thought to it is this. Yes, we have the birth and on the far right is the death. But it's what in the middle that I'm talking about. What are we doing with that dash? That's us. That's it. That's what sums up our life. When people come to say goodbye to their loved ones, and if we've gone on before them, and they happen to walk by where we are buried beneath the sod, they're going to look at our name, they're going to look at our birth, they're going to look at our death, and they're not going to know anything about us at all. That dash symbolizes what we've done with our life and how we've impacted the world. I would say that in three short days that Jesus was dead and buried, his dash has impacted our life like no other. Because he died, and in the same year, in a few short hours, in a few days, he was up and at it again. But he impacted lives just during that short period of time. What about while he was on this earth? What he did while on this earth is still impacting lives today. It's still impacting my life. When I opened the Bible, because it's an eternal book written by an eternal God who has eternal truths found in that book, it's amazing what I find every time I open it up because God shows me things that I did not see before. And it's not because I'm special. It's because I'm sinful. And because I'm sinful, it's easy for me to forget what God has done for me. And God reminds me through the reading of his word, that special time, that special place that I meet with God. Imagine this. Our bodies are laid in the grave. What are we doing with our dash? Look at this. When we think about what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, we would have to say that Christ died for sinners, would we not? Those people that we define as sinners are people like me and people like you. People who have bowed their heads, prayed the sinner's prayer, and asked Christ to come into their heart. They know that Romans 3.23 is talking about them. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ died for sinners. He died for me. 
and Christ died for you. Remember last week I told you that scriptures had to be fulfilled? Well, when he was on the cross, Isaiah 53 became a reality. For he was wounded for me. He was wounded for you. He was beat for me. He was beat for you. He had nails placed in his hands for me. He had nails placed in his hands for you. He was placed on a cross for me. He was placed on a cross for you. That spear that the Roman soldier took and placed it deep into his side, and the Bible says out came blood and water. Doctors tell us that the reason that blood and water came out is because the person that died, the agonizing death that they died, died of a broken heart. No doubt he died of a broken heart. He gave it all. We can't give a little? Or is it we give a little, but we think we're giving a whole lot? Is it we need to redefine what giving a little and giving a lot means? Or is it we know what's best for our life and we know what's best on how to define our life and, and we know how much we can give and we know how much we can't give and we know what decisions need to be made and we know what decisions do not need to be made and, and we place God somewhere in the midst of it all so that we can say, well, you know, I prayed about this. Really? Really? You know, I would never criticize anybody with their prayer life. But, you know, my question would always be this. So, every day when you've had that quiet time with God, and you've read the Bible, and you've prayed, it was during that time. Not in an emotional crisis. Not when everything was falling apart. And you believed emotionally that God was leading you. You know, I've been emotional driving down the road when I've gotten lost, and my emotions have only taken me farther out of the way. And there's been times when I've had the GPS on and I said, no, 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 you're wrong. There's no way if I go down, make a right here and make a left and make this U-turn, it can get me back where I need to be going because I know where I'm going. You know, not to be unkind, but there's nothing any worse than a GPS that has a female's voice. It's, it's bad enough when it's a man's voice, but when it's a woman telling you what to do, I mean, I'm just teasing, all right? Whew. Man, it got cold in here real quick. Look at this, would you please? As we close, <laughs> as we close, I want you to take a good look at the garden tomb, would you please? You see, because the garden tomb became the scene of the resurrection. What does the empty tomb mean? Look at it real quick. Well, we know an angel was there to stand guard. Not just any angel, but an angel that protected the Lord Jesus Christ. The empty tomb means, number one, he's alive. Number two, fulfillment of scripture. Number three, salvation to all who believe. Number four, justification to all who believe. Number five, assurance to all who believe. Number six, our preaching and faith and witness are not in vain. And number seven, I love this. He is alive and he'll never die again. The first time he came, he came as a little lamb to be taken to Calvary's Hill, to be slaughtered, to be crucified, to have his blood shed so that we could have redemption, covering for our sin. But ladies and gentlemen, I got news for the world. This next time he comes, they're not going to nail him to a cross. They're not going to beat him. They're not going to shackle him. Because he's not coming as a little lamb. He's coming as a lion with a loud roar. As the king of kings, the king of all. And when they go to place their hands on him this time, I look for him to say, you did it once, but you're not going to do it again. And I'm glad at that time, I'm going to be on his side. How about you? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to have our invitation song this morning. Would you stand with me this morning? As we stand this morning, I do not know where you're at in your life as a believer, as a non-believer, but here's what I do know. I know that God will accept us right where we are, just as we are, the person that we are, and no one else will do that. There's always conditions 
If you change insurance companies, health insurance companies, they want to know about pre-existing conditions before they will insure you. God takes us just as we are. Isn't God good? Whatever your need may be this morning, Christian, if the message has touched your heart, spoken to your heart, maybe it's time that you come and you say, you know, God, I'm giving it all to you. I've listened to the message, and God, I'm going to do what I know needs to be done. All Ron did this morning, God, was confirm really what I've been feeling in my heart anyway. And isn't it amazing that's how God works? He's awesome and he's wonderful. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ. You've never became a Christian. We want to give you the opportunity to do that now. Would you sing with us this morning? Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Sing out this morning, would you?